So one of the great things about the Empower project that I mentioned earlier, where we're studying four skills and how employers, educators, and students define them, well, when I started to look into communication, I quickly realized that my knowledge about that from a communication studies or communication instruction background was pretty much zip. Um, my trainings in learning sciences and anthropology and I didn't know about how to teach communication, what it meant, and when we started to dig into that field, in part because one of our collaborators was a communication studies scholar at RIT, I quickly recognized we need to give the platform to people who have been studying this for their entire professional careers. And so it's my great pleasure today to introduce April Kadravitz from NC State, who is one of those experts on communication instruction, and fortunately we have at our meeting here today um, at least three scholars of communication education. So if you're at all interested, please find them and uh, pick their brains. But um, if you could join me in welcoming April to give our keynote for today. Thank you, Matthew, for inviting me. Um, I've really enjoyed the conversations we've been having this morning, and so many of your questions and your comments lead directly into some of the things I'm going to talk about this afternoon. So hopefully we can have a really good engaging Q&A um, at the conclusion of the, of the talk. I'd like to begin just by sort of framing the context of my experience and the remarks that I'll make today by sharing with you my communication journey. So my journey, interestingly enough, began not far from here, about 100 miles north, at the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point. Yeah, yay, some pointers in the back. Um, and so while I was at UW-Stevens Point, this is really where my passion for communication emerged and my um, desire to teach. So while I was there, I spent two years of my master's program teaching public speaking to undergraduates from across our campus because Communication 101, um, at least at that time, was required for all of our undergraduate students. From there, I continued my journey to the University of Utah, went many, many miles out west, and um, earned my PhD and took my first position um, post-graduate education. And that's really where my experience at Utah informed my passion for teaching communication to non-communication majors developed. So while I was a graduate student, I spent an inordinate amount of time teaching communication to engineering students, to business students, to math students. And I really developed um, an appreciation for how powerful communication can be for people who are not trained, right? That's not their home discipline. When I finished um, my graduate work at Utah, I took a position as the founding director of the university's um, CLEAR program. And that stood for um, Communication, Leadership, Ethics, and Research. This was basically a college-wide engineering communication initiative. And the purpose of this program was to equip our engineering graduates with the communication skills they would need to be successful in the workplace. This was a very robust program. Um, I was the director, and I had a staff of 12 graduate students from communication and composition who provided integrated communication instruction into engineering students' core required courses. And I'll share a little bit more um, about that program as we go through the presentation today, because I will rely on that to provide some really concrete examples for how this works in practice. After 10 successful years at the University of Utah, I continued on my journey to North Carolina State University, which is where I am now, and in that capacity, I was hired to develop and um, coordinate a pre-clinical communication program for all of our veterinary medicine students. And so we have three courses that are a part of our core curriculum um, that deal with issues like teamwork um, and then clinical communication, where we take students through how to take a history with a client while doing a physical exam, how to make good medical recommendations and explain things in ways um, that clients can understand, how to engage them in collaborative decision making, culminating all the way through to how do you help that person when they're trying to make really difficult decisions about end of life care. 
So that's a little background um, about sort of how I got here and how my interest has developed over time. And it's important because this provides a context for the remarks that I'll make today. So the 20 plus years of experience teaching communication to people who are not communication majors, as well as my um, research background in professional communication, socialization, and identity issues inform um, the remainder of the remarks today. So the first thing, and I think we all know this, and this was alluded to earlier in some of the other presentations, is that communication really is crucial. Both um, the process of communication is important to developing strong professional relationships. It's important to being able to collaborate um, as part of a team. And it's important, quite simply, just in getting everyday work done. Formal products of communication, so things we think about when we think about um, giving presentations or producing technical reports or proposals. Speaking and writing is also important because it is a reflection of who we are as professionals. People make judgments about us and our ability to be a good engineer or a good veterinarian based on our communication. It's also really important for employability. So we've, we've heard from people this morning talking about how important it is for internships to actually lead to employability and to do so in a shorter amount of time. And so I submit that really communication is what's going to help people get jobs early, right? So it's important for short-term employability. But we also know it's important for long-term employability. So when I worked in the College of Engineering, routinely, our industry representatives who were hiring our graduates would say, we expect when they graduate with an engineering degree that they are going to be competent engineers, right? And this, I think, was a question someone brought up earlier. So that is their credentials. It is expected you know how to practice veterinary medicine, right? It's expected that you know how to be a good civil engineer. But what sets graduates apart from their peers who are also equally credentialed is their ability to communicate. So it's important for long-term employability because it's directly related to their ability to be good leaders. So it comes as no surprise then that industry leaders seek new hires that can communicate effectively. But more than that, they seek new hires who can communicate with industry-specific audiences in very particular ways. And what counts as competent communication differs if you are an engineering student or a veterinary medicine student, a teacher, a nurse, someone who wants to go into marketing. There are nuances associated with each of those disciplines that sort of specify what, is, what counts as competent communication. Now, certainly some skills are transferable. And I'll talk about some of those a bit later in the presentation. Um, but one size communication instruction does not fit all. And so while we might think that if our students take a basic course in communication, we can check that box that we've trained them in terms of communication, we know that that's not really how it plays out in practice. So there still is a gap between what we do in the academy to try and prepare our graduates and what the workplace is requiring. So we need to find a way to sort of bridge academics and the workplace. Because of that, there's been a shift toward um, more nuanced approaches to teaching communication and to teaching it across disciplines. And so before I can really talk about the communication in the disciplines approach, um, which is a the approach that I will advocate for very strongly, we do have to understand um, that there are other models that exist and that they are working also to try and fill this gap. So the first is what's known as communication intensive courses. You may have heard of these as writing intensive courses as well, right? So we'll talk about those. From there, we also have what's known as communication across the curriculum programs. And there are some very successful programs at universities across the country that are working diligently to prepare students from all majors. Then we have what's known as communication in the disciplines. And both of my experiences in engineering and veterinary medicine are characteristic of this approach. And then finally, distributed communication training, which is exemplified by internships, co-ops, and practicums. Communication intensive courses are exactly what it sounds like. This is where we integrate speaking into primary subject matter so that students can develop their skills. For example, if they are a software engineer, they can present on topics related to software engineering. 
The idea is that in a communication intensive course, students are given multiple opportunities to practice speaking and to receive some feedback on their skills. The same is true in those writing intensive courses. A part of these initiatives may also include some faculty training so that faculty members are equipped to provide some basic instruction and evaluation. And they may also include some student support, but not necessarily. Also, the degree to which students are speaking in ways that exemplify opportunities to speak in the workplace may or may not be happening. So these could potentially look like workplace speaking opportunities, but they may look like more traditional academic speaking opportunities. So sort of what I think of as the opposite end of the spectrum from a course-based communication um, training is sort of a campus-wide communication training experience. And this is what's known as communication across the curriculum. So these are programs that serve students across campus of all majors. Typically, there are two um, prongs to communication across the curriculum programs. One targets faculty and the other targets students. So one-on-one -on -one consultations with faculty members designed to help them think about ways they can use speaking and writing to enhance teaching and learning in the classroom um, is a big focus of these programs. There may also be professional development opportunities. So this is, um, for example, you may have heard of some lunch and learns, brown bag lunches that happen, where you send out an announcement to people across campus and invite them to come and learn more about, for example, how to integrate oral communication into their classroom or how to evaluate students' writing. So professional development in the, term, in the form of targeted workshops. And then there's also the realm that targets students specifically. This can be in the form of graduate or undergraduate tutors where students can drop in and get help on their communication skills. From here we move to um, really what I consider to be about as robust a program as you can have without having students actually learn these skills in the workplace. And that's what's known as communication in the disciplines. This is where communication is integrated into a particular college or department, like the CLEAR program that I mentioned earlier in the College of Engineering. Instruction is situated so that students are speaking and writing and working as a part of a team on a project that is typical of what they will experience in the workplace. This requires a great deal of collaboration between the communication faculty and what I call the host faculty, right, or the, or the discipline-specific faculty. For these programs to be successful, we need to have someone who can spearhead the communication training and assessment, but also be very closely related to their partner in that host discipline. Typically, communication in the disciplines programs have scaffolded instruction. So in engineering, for example, we had communication instruction, and when I say communication in engineering, it was speaking, writing, and teamwork that was integrated into students' required core engineering courses. So these were not separate communication courses. And we scaffolded the instruction across several years. So we start with very basic skills, perhaps in year one, we build all the way to year four where hopefully we give our students a capstone experience where they're actually mimicking the kinds of projects that they will experience in the workplace. So communication in the disciplines is scaffolded, it is integrated, um, and it is very experiential, but simulation based for the most part. We get next to distributed communication training, which is really the focus of what we're talking about here today, which is where communication instruction can happen both within and outside the classroom. This is highly experience-based. So um, this includes things like internships, co-ops, practicums. Um, the students at NC State experience some level of distributed communication training when they rotate throughout the services in our hospital. This is where there's high level application of knowledge and skills in a professional setting. The best distributed communication models should include an element of professional development for the faculty mentors who are working with students. Um, if possible, working with the employee, employer partners because these models rely so heavily on that mentoring that takes place in the organization. 
So before we move in a little deeper to specifically internships, it can be helpful to sort of think about the differences between these approaches based on their distinguishing structural considerations. So just a quick summary, our CI courses, we target the course level. These are dedicated courses or assignments that have students engaging in some sort of speaking. And the delivery of um, the instruction and the evaluation of students is done by non-communication faculty. Sort of on the other end of this spectrum, we have communication across the curriculum, which targets the whole campus. It's the two-pronged approach of consultations and professional development. It does include training the trainer. So there are communication faculty at the helm of these programs who are providing the training to people from non-communication backgrounds. Um, but when this is implemented into the courses, again, the delivery is still coming at the course level from non-communication faculty. CID and the distributed model move us a little more closely to those authentic workplace communication experiences where communication is not separate from what students are doing if they're engineers or nursing students or veterinary medicine students. It's an integrated part of what it means to become a good engineer and so communication instruction is integrated and scaffolded. Part of the reason that communication in the disciplines and the distributed model are so powerful is because what happens through working in um, design courses and learning how to speak and write like an engineer, for example, is students are actually being socialized into a professional culture. So we know that every discipline has a distinguishing culture. I could list you many characteristics that make engineering unique from veterinary medicine, given my experience working in both of those disciplines. And we can see it in the way, in, in the way that um, we engage in various practices, in the values and in the norms that constitute how work gets done. All of those norms and values and practices impact how people communicate in those positions. So through practicing authentic communication, such that would characterize their work as an engineer or a veterinarian, students are developing a professional identity that is congruent with those norms. So let's move into internships, because I think internships are probably one of the ways we can help fill this gap that I mentioned earlier. I'm gonna cover five sort of what I consider to be best practices to help you think about how you can cultivate development of communication skills in internships. One is to leverage the current practices that are happening at your institution. And if you don't know, maybe there's sort of a step before this that is, let's see what's already happening at our institution to prepare students to communicate effectively. Collaborate with your industry partners to develop really clear expectations Encourage development of communication across multiple modalities. Foster goal, sent, goal setting, mentoring, feedback, and reflection. This is actually the process by which students' communication skills will develop over time. And then finally, determine if what, what you're doing works. So develop clear assessment procedures. Let's dive into each of these a little bit more deeply. So first, leverage current practices. Every institution is different. Um, your uh, mission, of your institutions are going to be different and the way that you teach students will be different. So familiarize yourself with what's happening already. Student, if we think that we're gonna send students out to an internship and they're going to get all the communication skills they need in that one experience, we are sadly mistaken. So there needs to be some work happening before we send them out to those internships. So find out what's happening See what professional development opportunities there are for you to learn more about sort of best practices for coaching communication if you'll be working directly with students. Um, and again, think about how you might be creative in developing partnerships if there aren't things that already exist on your campus. Reach out to the communication faculty members. See if there's anyone in the department who's interested in doing cross-disciplinary work who might already be doing some of this work. Also think creatively about how you might partner with colleagues in education, for example, to try and determine necessary skill sets and how you might assess those skill sets. Once you've sort of done that background um, research, then I think the next piece is really spending some time planning with your industry partners. And I know every internship experience looks a bit different. Sometimes students are taking a four credit course that aligns with the internship, sometimes they're not, right? So the level of sort of structure and oversight varies. 
Um, but collaborating with your industry partners to develop those expectations is really crucial for students to have a meaningful experience. So think about things like, what are the goals of that industry partner? Why do they want to bring on internships, right? What are your goals for sending internships out there? What are the responsibilities, right, both for you, if you're someone who works closely with your internship program, as well as for them? What responsibilities do you expect from them? What sorts of activities will students be engaging in, right? Will they be able to participate as part of a project team, for example, and, and sort of model and practice their own teamwork skills? Or will they sort of be job shadowing? So it's, it's important to be clear about what students will be doing. Likewise, I would encourage discussions about expectations around supervision and mentoring, because that really will be crucial to try to cultivate communication skill development in an internship program. Once you've sort of done the planning, then I think it's really important to think about cultivating competence across modalities. So at the core, I always come back to these three, speaking, writing, and teamwork. And speaking and writing includes, again, those more formal opportunities that we think about, right? Giving a presentation, some sort of formal presentation, or producing some sort of formal documentation. So if students can have experience with that in the workplace, hopefully that builds upon what they've already learned throughout their academic experience, that's going to be a much more robust internship experience that will lead to good, strong development of those skills. It's also important for students to be given an opportunity, however, to cultivate some of the skills that we've talked about this morning that lead to their social capital. So it isn't just about the formal product, it's also about those more informal processes of communication that characterize the development of really good, strong, interpersonal, professional relationships. And so I think it's important for us to come back to what does competent communication really look like? if we're talking about how we navigate the day-to-day -day interactions. And so these are really the three things that I encourage you to keep in mind. When I say competent communication, this is what I mean. At the core, communication should be appropriate. So remember I mentioned how important communication is to a novice's socialization into a disciplinary culture, right? The development of professional identity. Well, the norms, right, that's a part of being a competent communicator, knowing what is appropriate. What are the norms governing this particular communication interaction? So in veterinary medicine, for example, there are very different norms, even within that discipline, about what counts as competent communication if it's an emergency situation, right? What is appropriate is different if we have an emergency situation than if we have a routine wellness visit, for example. Communication um, should also be flexible. So this means that you're able to adapt your information, your way of communicating, in order to reach that person that you're talking to. So one way to think about this is communicating with experts, right, or people within your discipline, and communicating with lay people or people outside of your discipline. It can be the same message, but the way that you craft it, what you say, how you explain that information, is going to be different, dependent on who you're talking to. One of the things that I get asked to talk about a lot um, in my new position in veterinary medicine is cross-generational communication. So that's another example of how we need to be flexible and prepared to adapt the manner in which we're communicating if we're communicating with millennials or maybe Gen X or baby boomers. So just as another example. Hopefully if our communication is appropriate and flexible, it will also be effective. So in any encounter, we have a goal or a purpose, something that we're trying to accomplish with our communication. And if we have communicated in flexible and appropriate ways, we should be able to realize our goal. At a minimum, it should feel like it was a good encounter, and that's what's known as being satisfying. Now to help our students, this gets back again to those sort of the more social capital skills. To be a competent communicator is not simply learning genres and following a formula. It is really um, about having a keen awareness of what's, on, what's happening in any given encounter and making a conscious decision about what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. 
It's also about interpersonal sensitivity, right? Or being able to understand how what you're thinking and what you're feeling impacts your ability to communicate with another person. Which leads me to the final element, which is actually the verbal and nonverbal skills that we use. So these are important, these nonverbal and verbal skills are important for things like providing and receiving feedback, for engaging in good problem solving sessions, for navigating conflict with a colleague, right? These things that we think somehow, even if we don't teach our students, they'll pick it up at some point along the road. And they don't, so we need to be purposeful in giving them the tools to be able to navigate these situations. In veterinary medicine, we come back to, and again, this is an example of a very discipline-specific approach to communication, we always come back to the core, four core interpersonal skills. So if I were to ask my students, what are the four core skills, they would rattle them off. One, two, three, four, no problem. But I think that these skills actually apply no matter what the discipline is when we're talking about developing that strong social capital. So an ability to ask good questions with a genuine curiosity and then listen with a desire to understand and thoughtfully respond as opposed to react. I think we have a tendency to judge and react very quickly in most situations and an ability to understand the other person's experience and perspective for what it is. And that's what's known as empathy. And I think these are the four skills when we think about those more, more informal communication encounters that we have in any organization, how we're gonna work on a team productively together, how we're gonna resolve conflict if we disagree, how we're going to give feedback if we wanna see a shift in performance, these are the four core skills. These are, are good for you as educators as well, right? So if you're working with students, you want to provide some coaching and mentoring, coming back to these skills um, is one way to do that. And the good news is we can teach these skills too. So, and this is the model that I would encourage you to use um, and to encourage your industry partners to use if prioritizing the development of communication skills is something that's a part of that experience. Goal setting, mentoring, feedback, and reflection. First, I really would encourage you when you're working with your students to um, ask them to be very specific about what skills they want to develop as a result of an internship experience. And it should be something that's relevant to sort of what they want, what they think they may want upon graduation. So goal setting is sort of the very most important first step because it will dictate the sort of coaching and mentoring that takes place as well as the feedback that is provided. Does anyone not know what SMART goals are? I, I guess I should stop there, okay. Then the mentoring is really the key and I think mentoring both from you if you're someone who interacts with students who are participating in internship experiences or if you teach a class that's related to internships but also the mentoring that gets provided by your industry partners is another really important piece in that socialization process. Learners are always watching mentors and role models, people who they look up to. So it's important for us to remember that when we interact with students, but it's also important for our industry partners to understand that. And it can be helpful, I think, sometimes to think about what are effective mentor behaviors. It's a nice reminder. I think one of the most important things, it seems very obvious, is to simply be available. So again, this is where having those conversations and setting those clear expectations about the responsibilities of each person involved in this process becomes really crucial. So be available. If someone doesn't have time to mentor students, might wanna see if there's someone else who's willing to do that if they want to take on interns. Listen to them, set clear expectations, and then two really important things, motivate students to challenge themselves, to stretch a little bit outside of their comfort zone, and be prepared to provide frequent feedback which leads me to the next um, key element in this sort of learning cycle of communication skill development. One of the models that I found really effective in my work um, in veterinary medicine, and this is also the model that gets used when students rotate through various services, so it does sort of get used in our distributed portion of our curriculum, is what's known as agenda-led outcomes-based assessment. And so essentially what this means is that the learner sets the agenda for what they want 
what skill they want to develop. So throughout working with students in practice, you'll have an opportunity to observe those skills and then start with them, right? If it's, a, if it's a coaching opportunity, if it's an opportunity to provide feedback, invite them to share what they perceive to be sort of their strengths and maybe their opportunities for development relevant to their goal. So start there. That's really key because it, it's, it empowers them, it makes them active in their learning and growth, and it also gives you a sense of um, their understanding of where they are in terms of their competence. And that will become key in a couple of slides. At the core, always remember to provide constructive feedback that kind of follows these objectives. And again, this is something that could be helpful to share with your industry partners if they're not familiar with how to provide effective feedback. Always, whenever possible, as soon as you can after you see them do something, whether it's something really positive or an opportunity for them to sort of grow and develop. Focus on the behavior, not the person. So I have found um, in my work at State that um, our students want feedback, but it's also highly uncomfortable for them, which is why letting them lead the discussion can be so powerful. And always come back to behavior that you saw, quantify with facts, and again, this support piece is really crucial. Make it a partnership with them, right? What can I do to help you improve in this area? And come back to their goal. So feedback with a goal is more likely to lead to enhanced performance than feedback in the absence of any sort of targeted goal or objective. Now I mentioned that it's important to get a sense of where students think they are in terms of their skill. Something else to consider is tailoring the feedback that you provide toward where students are in terms of their competence. So I think it will be highly unlikely that we will have students who are on the far right end of the spectrum, which is unconscious competence. So this means that you are able, for example, with respect to communication, you're able to communicate competently all of the time and you do it without having to think about it. So it's just ingrained. These are what we think of when we think of experts, right? People who are professionals who have been doing something for a very long time. On the opposite end, we have what's known as unconscious incompetence. So these might be people who are not very good at a particular skill and are not even aware that they are not very good at a particular skill. So that's why, again, starting with the learner's agenda is so important. If they tell you, I really think I, I rocked that in that team meeting because here's what I did, and you're thinking, I didn't see that at all um, in that team meeting, right? So that's an opportunity for you to provide feedback that says, well, here are some things that you might have done a little bit differently, but at the core, it's really important to provide a lot of encouragement to people when they're just starting out. If we move up a level, we get to what's known as conscious incompetence. So these are people who might not be very good at something, and they know they're not very good at something. And so what people need once they know they're not very good at something are balanced levels of encouragement and good constructive criticism. And then we might have folks who are really good at something, but they have to think a lot about it, right? So I'll have students routinely tell me at the end of a simulated client interaction, oh, I'm so proud of my ability to ask good questions and listen without interrupting. But I really had to think about it the entire 25 minutes I was engaging with that client, right? So they can do it, but it really has to be at the forefront of their mind. So consider that when you're thinking about ways that you might provide feedback and also share this with your industry partners so that they have a model that they can use. And then the last piece is to invite some critical reflection from our learners. So we don't simply learn by doing something because we can continue to do something that might be not very competent, but we do it over and over again. We're not learning anything from that experience. So it's really important that we also invite reflection from our students about how they think something went. What were my strengths when I offered to give that presentation? What things maybe could I work on next time? And what's my plan for trying to further develop those skills? 
So at the beginning of every communication course that I teach every semester, I ask my students to set a goal on the very first day of one thing related to their communication that they want to prioritize throughout that semester's experiences. And then at the end of the semester, they have to write a reflection where they're able to think through what were the things that helped me accomplish my goal, where am I still struggling, what made it difficult for me, and what do I want to still continue to work on. So it's important that we engage them in reflection. This is important for growth, it's important for lifelong learning, and it quite frankly is something that all of us as professionals should be doing. Then finally, if we've done all of these things, how do we know if it's worked? So developing clear assessment procedures um, is sort of the final piece that I would encourage you all to think about. There are multiple ways that you can gather assessment data. Um, you might, for example, um, survey students at the beginning of an internship and at the end of an internship where you might get their perceptions about their ability to communicate, for example. Um, or it could be anything, doesn't necessarily have to be communication. You might do the same with the people who are supervising the interns, right? Survey them. How would you rate student skill level in these areas at the beginning and at the end? Now those are perceptions, right? It's not necessarily an objective assessment of how well students are communicating. But there is some value in being able to assess perceptions. Because if we feel like we've improved our confidence in our ability to communicate over time, we're more likely to seek out additional opportunities to communicate and are in fact more likely to enhance our competence. If there are ways for you to capture student skill development, so for example, you might have them complete a portfolio. If you have the ability to record students doing something, so every simulated client encounter that our students do gets recorded. So I can then look at their very first one and look at where they are right before they go into clinics and I can say, this is what I've seen in terms of skill development over time. When I taught in the College of Engineering, it was the same thing. We had a communication lab, we recorded every presentation they gave, and we did robust assessment of those presentations so that we could in fact show this is making a difference. Or maybe this didn't work this time, here's how we need to change. So I would encourage you to think through how you will assess. And also, this assessment, by the way, makes for great research data. So we heard Matthew talking earlier about really cultivating strong research agendas around these experiences. This is one way to gather that really robust, authentic data. So I'd just like to leave you with sort of my key guiding principles for professional communication training whenever possible, situate that training. It's much more powerful for students' development of professional identity and for preparing them for what the, what's going to happen when they enter the workforce. Plan and coordinate your efforts with your industry partners. Encourage goal setting, mentoring, feedback, and reflection as part of that learning cycle for students to develop their communication skills. Incorporate ongoing professional development. This is crucial. So one of the things I do, although I teach students primarily, I do a lot of workshops for our faculty clinicians in the services of our hospital. Because they want to make sure that the things they're modeling and the feedback they're giving is congruent with the things that students are being taught. And then finally, seek and provide feedback to inform future practices. So with that, um, I will open it up for questions. Our students are um, re are, learn how to write really well. So a lot of writing intensive communications. But when it comes to being in the real world and writing in a business setting or a nonprofit setting, they would rather write a 20 page research paper mm -hmm. than a cover letter or right. write to real people instead of to academicians. And so uh, how do you build that into um, a practice in an internship model? So let me make sure I understand your question correctly. So your students are good academic writers, but not so good at professional writing or technical writing. Right, they're very, they're very confident very, and very competent in that realm, right. but to get them to understand that it's a different kind of writing and, it's a, and, and they need to learn again, and then how do we give them instruction or support to, do, to achieve that? As I was reading the news on my phone, um, I think Inc. Magazine published it, and they said, 
why everything you learn in your English classes is wrong, essentially, which gets at this very point. Now, I'm not up here saying what everything they learn in English classes is wrong, but I think this is important, and your question gets at the core of why I'm such a strong advocate for the communication in the disciplines approach. So providing students with those opportunities to write a resume and cover letter um, for a real job that they would like to seek upon graduation and then giving them feedback on how well they did is how you do it, right? So I don't know what sort of support you have at your university for sort of integrating these communication skills into coursework, but that's what I would recommend is that you make some sort of a connection maybe with people who teach writing or if you have a writing center, um, but find a way to build in some sort of experience, even writing something like a memo, right? So we spent a lot of time teaching our engineering students how to write technical memos, one to two pages. So again, very different from what they learned in freshman English or composition. And it's very hard to go from I'm writing in an academic manner to earn that A in my English class versus now I have to distill it down to a couple of paragraphs and write extremely precisely and concisely. But again, that's the power of either relying on a communication center or a communication across the curriculum model to sort of develop those assignments that can be integrated into coursework or a communication in the disciplines program that can do a lot of that work for you. I sat here listening to you speak, and we have uh, common the major courses, but what role do you see career services playing in that? We end up seeing the end product a lot of time, mm -hmm. yet we've had not a lot of input in what they're being taught in those classes, and sometimes it, to me, and I think some of my colleagues would agree, is, is not how we would recommend resumes and cover letters are being written. And we have inroads, we're trying to create liaisons with these departments, mm -hmm. but I would love to have everybody kind of come together and have some commonalities, but that, that's a challenge. I, and I, again, we're, we're, we're having students come to us and we're just sort of like, ah. Right. <laughs> yeah. and so how do you see the role of career services in this? I think that you definitely need a seat at the table where you should be in communication with whoever is teaching students writing at UW-Stevens Point or teaching communication so that you can get on the same page about what the new expectations are for resumes and cover letters. And again, that you know, you're the person who is the liaison with industry professionals, and I think that's why it's so important to have both forums like this, but at every institution, right, there should be a communication loop between the professionals who are going to be hiring graduates and what their expectations are, the career service professionals who are going to be mentoring students, and the people who are um, either within that host discipline or in communication and writing who can provide those opportunities to sort of prepare students for that. So yeah, I think it's crucial for career services to have a seat at that table. Hi, I'm Deborah Cart from UW Parkside, and um, I have a question about, um, you mentioned a couple, on a couple of slides where you said this is a really good thing to talk to employers about mm -hmm. or supervisors, mm -hmm. and so I wondered, have, have you done training yourself or does your campus train um, regional employers for students coming into internships, and if so, how do you get them to come, or do you go to them, or how do you do it? In veterinary medicine, I do a lot of training with industry professionals. Um, but, but again, veterinary medicine is a bit unique in that um, for them to um, keep their license current, they have to participate in a certain number of continuing education requirements every year. Um, but we host on our campus CE that is related directly to communication, client communication, teamwork, um, and so they come to me and I deliver the CE so that they can sort of be brought up to speed about what our students are being taught. Um, and it also enhances their practice. So most of the time, actually, we don't have to work very hard. Um, people call me and say, can you help me? Um, it will enhance my practice. It will enhance my ability to mentor new graduates. So I agree with you about the value of communication in the disciplines, but so many uh, professional engineering teams are interdisciplinary, mm -hmm. or they do interdisciplinary work, or in the case of our civil engineering students in particular, are often put in front of public meetings. Yes. So I'm wondering if when you were still working with engineering students, either from students who are coming back from internship or in talking to internship sponsors, whether you had any pushback on that model that indicated um, 
more interdisciplinary opportunities would be effective and valuable for students as well. I hear you and I, our civil engineers um, did have to participate in public meetings so that was a part of what we did because we recognized that that was a very industry specific audience and we did um, have a lot of engineering teams that were working on projects that spanned multiple departments so students actually were working with mechanical engineers and bioengineers and chemical engineers on one large project that actually was a real project that came from an industry sponsor. Um, those were typically things that occurred usually in their senior year capstone experiences and we spent the prior years sort of teaching them the skills to lead up to that but that very much was a part of it yes the multidisciplinary teams is huge in engineering um, and it's it's only going to become even more important and it's not just engineering now right as we see in this room today we come from various disciplines and finding ways to sort of bridge our experiences and communicate effectively across our disciplines is really important. I don't know if it's because it seems like you work primarily in professional schools, so it, it then it's obvious like you can ask the nursing industry about communication and nursing. Mm -hmm. What informs the curriculum in the disciplines where that path is not clear? Like in like the history department or the art history department, or I'm just wondering mm -hmm. how you build the curriculum in the disciplines where you don't necessarily know where that student is going to land. I would start by trying to gather some data on where the majority of students with your that graduate from your program do land, right? So you're not going to hit them all, but at least if you can start there, right, with where do the majority of our graduates get placed, and then try to reach out and make connections, maybe send an electronic survey, right? What are the typical communication um, expectations associated with this job? What kinds of documents will students be expected to write? What kinds of speaking opportunities will they have? Will it be primarily to the public? Um, I imagine with history, right, some students are going to be placed in museums. They might, you know, who knows, talking to the public or talking with other experts within history. So I think at the, as sort of a first step, you're right, there are certain disciplines that allow us to gather that good data that comes from our industry partners or that comes from accreditation bodies. So I didn't even mention that, but you know, communication is now an outcome that is associated with engineering, with veterinary medicine, with nursing, with pharmacy, where graduates of these programs have to demonstrate competence in communication. So we can get it from accrediting bodies, um, but I think the other piece is we have to try and go out and get as much as we can from those industry partners. As I was listening um, to your incredible uh, presentation, I kept reflecting back on my background in talent development at a Fortune 500 company in the financial services industry. And the model for the playbook for communicating is in alignment with. Is in what? So I'm sorry. It's in alignment. Uh -huh. It's in alignment with what you've shared that you're teaching um, and coaching, supporting the students with. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking if, this, if the culture of the campus is not in alignment with the model, then they are segmenting when to practice it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious to learn, has the campus modeled that practice? And, and that way, based on a prior colleague's comment, that it happens not just in the curriculum, but it's the, the culture, if you will, of the campus. Mm -hmm. And that's where we're getting pushback. I can speak to it from both my work in the Fortune 500 industry as well as in higher education is, is if it's only happening in a course or in selective environments. Because unfortunately, being able to turn it on and off is where we're having challenges. We mm -hmm. keep hearing this feedback about, you know, the students not having the soft skills or, or not being able to um, turn it on, turn it off, and to be frank, they need to keep it on. Mm -hmm. um, that's important because, well, we know 21 days of same uh, behavior can create a successful habit. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, are you seeing that happen as a culture on the campus? Routinely, I get more requests than I can accept from faculty within our college to provide workshops, lunch and learns. Um, I mean, I just, I'm the, I am communication for our college, and so they come to me. Uh, but part of that, I think, I guess what I would say here, and this is, we could talk for hours about 
how to sort of work around these issues. Yes, it's important that it is college-wide, right, or at the very least departmental-wide. If it can be campus-wide, even better. We at NC State also have a campus writing and speaking program that is very successful, um, that does a lot of professional development. So I would say there is appreciation for communication campus-wide, certainly at the college level. What I can tell you is that one of the defining differences between my experience in engineering and my experience in veterinary medicine was the level of strong leadership from the top, dean's level, to say, this is important, we value it. Um, so when I was at Utah, we had a change in deans. The dean that hired me said, this is important, we value it. Then we had a shift where that wasn't really a top priority anymore. And in, at NC State, in vet med, it comes from the dean's level on down. It's a priority, we value it. And so I think the leadership on a campus or in a college needs to buy in in order for that to become the culture. Um, I'm Elizabeth Zachary Rutschow, uh, Senior Research Associate at MDRC. Um, I'm wondering um, what your perspective is on, um, there's a lot of training, uh, so soft skills training programs, credentialing, especially for low wage workers as we try to advance them into mm -hmm. higher wage careers. And I'm wondering kind of what your perspective is on that, those types of programs. Um, they're certainly not integrated in the way that you're discussing, but I think there, there's a lot of them out there and I'm just curious to hear what your thoughts are. I'm not super familiar with how they work, but I do think any time we can provide training for um, low-wage workers or workers for whom right, their industry may have been phased out and we now need to equip them with new skills, I think anything we can do to prepare those workers is crucial. But again, I, have, okay. I know of, but not intimately familiar.